Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. I want to dedicate this episode to my wife, Shauna. On May 18th, in the secular calendar, and the seventh of Savan in the Hebrew calendar is our 18th wedding anniversary. And 18th is such a perfect number to represent my marriage to my wife. 18 represents Chai, life, and she has truly given me life. So I want to discuss an idea today. I want to propose a a thesis, if you will. And my thesis is the following, and that is that God made us all to be addicts. Now, why am I saying that? Because we know that God created the world for only one reason, and that was to bestow pleasure. And he put us into this world, in this environment of free will, so we would have the ability to earn that pleasure. And when it comes to him and his Torah, he gives us a very insatiable appetite. The more one studies Torah and does mitzvot and draws closer to God, the more they want it because he is infinite. So he designed us to pursue this pleasure, the real pleasure of him in more and more greater quantities. Now, there are many pleasures he has permitted to us in the Torah, but even within those permitted pleasures, because they're not true pleasure, we are instructed to be holy by even partaking of them in limited quantities. So for instance, one pleasure I absolutely adore is chocolate. My wife's always kind enough to keep chocolate in my desk drawer. Chocolate has some great qualities to help with cognitive functioning. And so I break all those chocolates up into little cubes. So during the day when I need a little pick-me-up, I eat one of those little chocolate cubes, enjoy it, enjoy the taste, and that little burst of energy that it gives me. However, if I were to sit and eat an entire chocolate bar, I would not be uplifted. I would feel sick to my stomach and not energetic and not alert, but more needing to take a nap. And everything is like that. Sleep, we are told to get only seven to seven and a half hours of sleep in the Shikon Aruch. Anything more than that just makes us more drowsy. Seven and a half hours sleep rejuvenates us. Too much sleep causes us to have the actual opposite effect of making us more lethargic. And plus, we don't want to waste our life sleeping as this is the world of action and the world to do mitzvot. There's even a mitzvot to say Kaddish and bring in Shabbos with a glass of wine. And one of the qualities of wine, which also includes whiskey, is that those are the only two creations that mirror that of the soul. Everything else in the physical creation deteriorates over time. You build a home and it immediately begins to depreciate. Our bodies are in a constant state of depreciation. But with wine, with whiskey... They get better over time. And that is the only thing in the world that does so, which is exactly what happens with the soul. It's the only thing that can appreciate and grow over time. So we're told to enjoy some wine or some whiskey and elevate our souls. But we're also warned about indulging too much. And so we're hardwired to pursue pleasures. But if we go after these other pleasures, even those that are especially not permitted, They all are defined as false pleasures because they all have negative consequences when we consume too much of them. And so one of the key aspects of our growth as Jews is to make sure that we are tapped in to the the real source of pleasure, which is God himself, which we get more of through the study of Torah and mitzvot. And what often can happen when we're not plugged into that source of pleasure is that since we are hardwired to pursue pleasure, we often end up pursuing other pleasures with harmful consequences. And that addictive nature that he built inside of us to pursue him more and more and more can go awry as we pursue these false pleasures. There's a other aspect of this as well. In order to be become vessels to get closer to God is we are constantly working on our midot, our character traits. And that's a very challenging task to do. We have a yetzahara, an evil inclination, or in secular parlance, the ego. That's there to give us free will and prohibit us from doing so. We are born with a default way of looking at the world. And that default is to only see the negative qualities in others 
and never give them the benefit of the doubt and only see our positive qualities and give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And we're supposed to flip that over 180 degrees to where we are only seeing the positive qualities in another. And then we see our positive qualities for ourselves as well, but we also see our negative qualities so we know what our mission is in life and what we need to fix. And it's very hard to go in and and identify your weak character traits. And it's even more so, and it only takes someone with a tremendous amount of courage that would say, I want to share my negative qualities or past mistakes with others. And I was approached by someone very special to me that wanted to do so, that wanted to come on the show and discuss her challenges, the negative qualities that she's been working and toiling with to improve and the past mistakes she's made. And when I asked, why would you want to do such a thing? That could be a little bit embarrassing. Her answer was, because by sharing my struggles, I can help out others that may be experiencing those same struggles. So I bring on Torah scholars all the time to this program to teach us things. But I have someone today very special. That is my most important teacher. My guest today is my beloved wife. She is the beautiful voice behind the intro and the closing of this podcast. And I would like her to introduce herself to you now. Good afternoon. My name is Shauna and I am an alcoholic. Hello, Shauna. I'm so glad you could be here. The reason Shauna won to come on, and I'm delighted that she is, is because once she became a recovering alcoholic and started going through the 12-step program, I saw something amazing in the 12 steps. It was basically a process of exactly what every Jew is supposed to be doing. It starts off with developing Amuna and, and trust in God. Then it goes into Masar, what they call taking a personal inventory to do that introspection, identify the weak qualities, the weak character traits, and then work to refine them. Then you move into a stage of Teshuva, where you begin to make amends with God, with anyone you did anything wrong with. And then it's just this ongoing loop. And that is exactly what every Jew is supposed to be doing. I'm actually a little quite envious of the alcoholic because God put them in this life or death situation to be doing what we're all supposed to be doing. And by putting them in that life or death situation, it made it something they had to act on when the fact is, is we all have to be doing these things at all times. So let's start at the beginning. And I'll set the stage a little bit for the audience. When Sean and I met, I was a devout atheist. And I thought she was too. She definitely left out some necessary disclosures in the prospectus because, as she will tell you, she had been pursuing spirituality her whole life. So, Sean, I want you to give a little background on what led to your pursuit of learning more and looking for a pathway to become closer to God. And I'll try to make a short story out of a long one. I wasn't brought up in a religious household, which... By any means, it was a wonderful childhood. I was loved, taken very well care of. But in my t- mid-20s, I think I just started to feel sort of an emptiness. And I don't know what I was looking for, but Judaism was always in the back of my mind. It was always something that I read about and studied. It just kind of kept a, a pretty decent reading list going on. And so that was always something in the back of my my mind. I just hadn't officially pursued it. I even knew how to or anything. And then I met Dan. And I don't know what made me do it. I think because he was Jewish. I'm like, I'm going to now I'm going to really look into this. And it wasn't obviously, like he said in the beginning, it wasn't of his pushing or demanding because he was very happy us being agnostic and not really affiliated with anything. And so I just happened to enroll in a class. We were living in Houston at the time and I enrolled in a class and it was just an intro to Judaism. And Dan reluctantly came with me. And from there, I did a reform conversion. So I thought, awesome, I've, my pursuit is done. You know, I'm now Jewish. I have, I have a home. I have a belonging. But obviously, there was something still missing. There was a, a hole somewhere. And I went searching for some other things. And there's a bunch of other things to kind of that go into the connecting of the dots of how I became an alcoholic. But during that time, whatever higher power or God I had, I replaced very quickly with a bottle. You've been sober for how long now? Since December 7th of 2016. 
And so that was shortly after we moved in this home and I wanted to start keeping Shabbos. And it was shortly after that, that you started going to AA. So share with us how that process of the 12 steps, as it sort of intermingled with your movement towards Torah observant Judaism and where we are now, where you are in the process of going through an orthodox conversion. So these things sort of happened hand in hand. Share with us, you know, as you began to go through those steps and how they dovetailed with your Jewish learning and your Torah observance and your de- development of Amuna. I do want to um, circle back a little bit. When I went from just a normie, a normal drinker and crossed over into the dark world of alcoholism, <laughs> I mean, I was Jewish in lip service only, you know, I was upholding all the you know, holidays, whatnot, but there was a massive lack of connection, obviously, or I wouldn't have turned to something else to fill that void. So when you end up in AA, you usually have hit some sort of bottom. It's not usually because you want to. You've hit some sort of a bottom. Everybody's bottom is different. They label it sort of an emotional bottom. So that doesn't necessarily mean you are living under a bridge. I had a house. I had a car. I had a kid. I had a husband who still loved me. I had everything going for me. Yet I was extremely unhappy. Unhappy and angry all the time. In my mind, and it's not the same for everybody, this is just my story. I was mentally at a bottom and I knew that the gig was up. Something needed to change. And I didn't know what or how. And I walked in those doors hoping that that was a solution. I will say this, that as we both became more and more religious, I finally came along as well later on, but took a a different path towards it. But the, the religious observance in the reform world, it's observance of the holidays, absence of the mitzvot. No one's fasting on Yom Kippur. Everyone's driving on Shabbos. Saturday, everyone just did whatever they had to do. I didn't know that I was lacking and there was something big missing, which makes sense why I was still wasn't feeling sane or full or fulfilled. Right. That was my point is that they sort of carve out the, the components of Judaism, the, the actual mitzvot observance that are there. And mitzvot means connection to connect us to the Almighty. And so th- that part of the equation all started to change as you started to move into and grow into your areas of sobriety. And a lot of that was the 12 steps, which, as we've discussed, is a total Torah recipe. So share with us, like, as you were going through those steps and continue to go through those steps on an ongoing basis, how they helped you grow in your religious observance as well, which is all, of course, intertwined with your personal life. Just sort of talk to that level. So we'll kind of, I guess, break it up into how you broke it up, which is how I break it up to sponsees that I have coming in. All a sponsee is somebody that I mentor through the steps. So one, two, and three are basically foundation builders. Dan, you had said it early in the beginning that it was a building of a Muna. I didn't know what a Muna was at the time. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. That wasn't... So difficult because like when I said earlier, when I walked in, something had to give. I was done. Something needed to change. But just admitting that I had to dig a little deeper and really look at how my life was unmanageable and admitting powerlessness, meaning I can't control this anymore. I can't fix it. I need something else, something bigger than me. And so that's where step two comes in. And at this time, too, I was Jewish, but I really didn't know what I believe. I hadn't dived into anything. Dan at the time was moving forward in his spirituality and his Torah study, and I was kind of just stuck, stagnant. So step two is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So, okay, I have to admit I believe in God, which I thought I, I did for all intents and purposes, but there wasn't a connection there. There, did I really believe? Did I really buy all this stuff? Could I believe that this higher being, Hashem, could restore me to sanity? So there I have to like admit I'm not sane, right? And so it had been described to me later on in my sobriety that sanity is wholeness. 
So sanity is wholeness. So insanity refers to there's something missing. There's not a whole. And so what I needed to fill that with to make it sane was Hashem. And for those of you who are listening that are are in the AA program, I'm going to say Hashem. That means God. That means my higher power. Just want to clarify that because it's inclusive, not exclusive. But this is my story and how I became closer to Hashem through this journey. So even those of you who are not struggling with alcoholism, as you can see, there is this process that we all have to go through where our sense of control over anything, whether we're, we're pursuing money for the wrong reasons or vanity or any type of false pleasure, gambling, overspending, all those things that create those, those short-term pleasurable highs that end up leaving us in a worse state that are not constructive for us, that we all have to go through this process of letting go. And that and I'm sure you'll confirm this, Shauna, that it's that letting go and putting your trust in God that is what allows that relationship to build. Like I on my podcast on Sadaka, that was sort of my mechanism for letting go with the money issues. The thing that comes into play and in what like came to believe that a power greater than ourselves is I believed I was the greatest power, that I can control these things, that I was driving the car or the plane or the bus or whatever. So those first three steps are huge slices of humble pie. So it's the beginning of building humility that I did not possess, which is why I was not hearing God calling me up directly on my iPhone because... I thought I was God. Now, I didn't think that, you know, because a lot of people come into the program or a lot of people come in and say, well, I go to church, I this, I believe in God. But did we really, did we really believe that all that Hashem could do? Because I was still trying to drive the car and control everything. And that first step, admitting I was powerless and my life was out of control was the first thing like, e, I'm not in control of anything. I cannot control this thing that is overpowering me. So the final step in that foundation building, because you have to go through these steps in chronological order. You can't cherry pick them. Just like in Torah, you can't, maybe this might be offensive to some, but you can't cherry pick what you want to do and what you can't because it just doesn't work out in the end. It's a, it's a process and it's in order for a certain reason. And you can't have one without the other because it all falls apart. So without this foundation, you know, you don't start to build a house with a roof you know, and forget about the foundation because your house is going to fall down. You know, I think too that the reason I'm a little envious is because we're not supposed to believe in God. We're supposed to know God. And that's why we have all the mitzvot and we're supposed to put our trust in him. And it's almost like God forced you just to know him because he didn't want you to intellectually just say, I believe in him. He gave me no choice for whatever reason. To me, I think that's because he sees something special. He sees a quality there. He sees you're, you weren't developing that deep relationship where you relied on him and he wanted that relationship with you so bad. He said, I'm going to put her in a place where she'll have no choice but to really develop a trust and a relationship with me. That's from my vantage point. I also want to um, comment on something you said in the beginning too about how you were envious of the alcoholic because they went through these 12 steps. Obviously, they're not exclusive to AA. They're used in any sort of recovery program. But when I first started going to the rooms, I would always hear, I'm a grateful alcoholic. And, you know, my first few weeks there, I'm like, what the H-E double hockey sticks are you talking about? This sucks. No, I don't want to be an alcoholic. But now that I have a few days behind me, I get it. Because most people, when they're not forced into it, they'll just go through life, their entire life, what I call the, a member of the walking dead. And they just go through life pursuing simple pleasures acquiring material possessions, building up a 401k, trying to live a life uh, leisure, and then they die and they didn't accomplish anything. Yeah, when you're not forced to find a connection with Hashem, you, you, mediocrity is okay. That's not okay for me. This is survival. So it has to be a daily reprieve. So let's start with step three. So here's the final step in building that foundation. And these steps, once you're done with them, doesn't mean you never go back. I always have to go back and eat that slice of humble pie and remind myself I am not all this in a bag of chips. And I constantly have to remember the only reason why I'm sober is because of Hashem. So step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God 
And they always put these disclaimers as we understood them, because like I said, it's inclusive, not exclusive. So being willing to let go, turn it over. What does that mean? Complete trust, Amuna. Now, I will say and admit that on a daily, I give it and then I take it back. I give it and then I take it back. I trust you, but maybe I know best. That never works out for me, by the way. Or any of us. No, it always comes back to me in different shape or form. So there you go. You build your foundation. How long this takes with somebody, it's all your own journey. And that builds to that evolution of what Hashem is to me, what I believe, what, what is God to me is ever evolving. And what I've learned in this process too is, like I said about the mediocrity, if I'm not moving forward, I'm standing still. And that's not okay for me. You know, Rabbi Ari always says that the reason we can't stand still is because it's, we're on an escalator. Either we're walking forward to move ahead, but if we try to stay still, we're just going to be moving back. And like I said, it's vital to all of us in recovery for our survival. Literally, to go back is for most of us death. And the reason I thought this was such a great subject for everyone to listen to is because, again, even if your struggle is not alcoholism or drugs, it is really death to be stagnant, to not grow. I mean, that is the reason he, God made us. And at Rosh Hashanah, when we're in Yom Kippur, when we're being evaluated to determine who's going to live and who's going to die. Well, if God can see that someone's a Jew's on a trajectory to be static and not grow, then they're not contributing to his world anymore. And that is very possibly a death sentence. So that's my idea here is that this is life and death for all of us. It just becomes more manifest and tangible for someone like in, in, in Shauna's position. I will say during this, uh, almost three and a half, over three and a half years ago, like I said, Dan, you were moving in a faster trajectory than I was. You know, this was all new to me. I was really, I was still um, very vulnerable at that time. I still am, but you know, like super vulnerable. And you had suggested moving. That was the first time Dan had suggested moving to the Aruv and I wasn't but a few months sober. <laughs> I was like, we had to have a conversation. I'm like, I support you. My journey's a little slower than yours. I'm not on that page yet. Fast forward three and a half, almost four years later, the house is up for sale and the whole family's ready to do that move. But it was a process and we were all on different, different uh, time frames for that. We, we all been going at different paces. But we're finally on a page to where we want to move. And actually, I want to go through a full conversion. And it was through these steps in my sobriety that got me closer to Hashem and to Torah. So let's move on to the next set. I think you were talking about character refinement, which would be four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so for those of you who are practicing Judaism, this is going to sound very much like high holy days. So four, step four made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and basically come to a conclusion what we call them character defects that caused this to happen. The big one is resentments. We always say resentment is the number one offender. It's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So resentment is the biggest one and the one inventory that we always tackle first because it's the hardest. I'll try to quickly go through this and hopefully understand I can talk all day about all this, but we want the bigger picture of how it relates to Torah and it all relates to Torah because it is Torah. These aren't original ideas. So during the days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, this is basically what you're supposed to be doing is taking an inventory of where you went wrong. So the first two columns, you work vertically. And then after you're done, you read it horizontally. But the first column is who, who are you mad at? It could be a person, it could be an institution, it could be a, an idea or anything. Like, who are you mad at? Second column, why? Easy peasy. You're like, oh, I totally got this. I can say who I'm mad at and why. Then the next third and fourth column gets a little trickier because you have to, what instinct did that touch and what was the character defect that caused it? So basically, you're searching for what was your part in this. And you can't, it's not, I'm going to blame the other person. Even if the other person did do wrong, you still got to find your part in it. And it could be very simple as I was there or really deep. In my case, I was just blaming everybody for everything. I was the victim. 
each person it's different and there's all sorts of scenarios that we could talk about and where your part lies in it. For me, I was, my part and everything was huge. So you go through your resentments, you go through your remorse, guilt, and do the same to columns. And then I had to think about fear, not like fear of spiders. Some of mine were, they may seem silly to the outsider, but some of them were what people thought of me. Will people like me? Things like that. And what part, what character defect, what was my part in that? Um, Insecurity, you know, which is an umbrella for, you know, fear. There's also a sex inventory, which doesn't necessarily mean extramarital affairs, which is when I really started understanding the rules of modesty. Because it's not necessarily pursuing the actual act. How do you present yourself? You know, so those modesty rules started to really, really make sense and how you conduct yourself and why those modesty rules were in place. So you're saying that even though a woman is not even interested, of course, this could be flipped for a man, but a woman who's not even would never dare go astray from her husband, but sometimes just dressing provocatively in order to get the attention. Get validation, attention, provoke jealousy. That's sexual misconduct. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to actually do the act. You know, so all these uh, modesty laws and why the men didn't shake the women's hands or they can't be alone. It was, you know, from an outsider looking in, it looks super archaic and like the women are being suppressed. And it's just not that. It's just building safeguards. So I think what you're saying, too, is there's something lacking in a person who's wanting to get that external validation because it means they're lacking in maybe the validation they want by just trying to please God. Exactly. Like I said, in this whole thing, something was missing and I had to figure out what it was. And, you know, I was guilty of searching for that validation. I had no intention of doing anything with it, but, and it wasn't until I got into the program and and we got to this part of the inventory and I'm like, I didn't do anything. I don't even need to fill this part out. And the more I thought about it, then, you know, sometimes the inventory is not done. I mean, because sometimes it takes a little bit of more sobriety, a little more time to actually figure out, that's what that means. And I don't think it was until last year that I like put two and two together. I'm like, I have, I have to go back and do that. I did act poorly. Well, and I had to figure out why. You know, I was saying at the beginning too, that we're, we're sort of hardwired to want to tap into the almighty. And, and really what Torah teaches us is that if we make his will, our will, if we just try to please him, that he'll make our will, his will, meaning we shouldn't be looking for validation from other people. We should look, be looking to respect people and love people, but the only one who we should be looking to for infinite love is him because you were lacking that at first. You were wanting that validation from these other people through maybe through your... Yeah, and I think through self-actualization, which is all this really is, is kind of figuring out what these character defects are that you need to refine. Without self-actualization, you can, I don't think you are in a position to do God's will yet. So that's why all this is necessary. It's, it's, it's painful, but it's the only thing that's going to ensure that you, when you go around and do those amends and you try to do God's will, that those are behaviors that can permanently change or have permanently changed. Because otherwise, again, it's just lip service. You got to walk the walk. And you mentioned it's, it's ongoing. It's the same for us. I mean, Musar is identifying, we're supposed to identify just one character token you work on and chisel away at that. And then, and that can take years. I know stories of sages that found one character flaw that they would spend three or four years working on, and they were already way more lofty than the rest of us. But it, it's an ongoing process. Well, this one step is just figuring out the who, what, why. I mean, you're just figuring out what these defects are, okay? And then step five is basic, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another being, the exact nature of our wrongs. I always call it the purging. Because, you know, you, you have to say it out loud. You got to let it out to Hashem. And then you need a witness. <laughs> and that's usually your sponsor in those situations. But, you know, obviously it's got to be somebody that you trust. Because there's some pretty dark stuff in there. And then when you're talking about Musar, that's where six and seven come in. So that original list, that original inventory in step four, you p- kind of have a list of the, the defects, the character defects you need to work on. Okay, so six is we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character 
and seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. So they kind of go together. And it always puzzled me before I got there. I'm like, I'm like, I did not believe like I could say, Hashem, please take these shortcomings away from him. I'm totally willing to give them up. And poof, <laughs> it's, it's not that, <laughs> you know, faith without works is dead. You gotta Just like Musar, these are things you have to tackle. Some of them are easy. Some of them are going to be a lifelong process. Some of them we're not ready to give up and we're not even sure. So you constantly pray for the willingness, willingness to give up some of these things. And we always say it's a progress, not perfection. So these are things that I will be doing for a lifetime. We have a a book that we read called Alcoholics Anonymous, and we refer to it as the big book. And it reiterates in there, there's lots of phrases and and words and and ideas that are constantly repeated throughout the book. And willingness is one of those things because nothing can happen. No change can happen without a willingness to do so. So 12 steps or recovery won't work unless there's a willingness to do something about it. Moving on to Shuva, I think was the next thing you said. So that's step eight and nine. I forgot to add on the inventory part, we do have a section where we actually list our assets because we do have, we're not bad people. <laughs> we just did bad things. There are some redeeming qualities still. And we have to have some, a little positive, something to build on. These are the things we want to build up because every negative quality, we have a positive one. So we're just trying to, and all this is, all 12 steps is just a massive change in perspective too. Then that's a Musar principle is that you first identify all your positive qualities because those are are going to what are going to empower you to fix your negative ones so you have to start off by first acknowledging all the amazing qualities that you have before you begin to tackle the negative i will say most of us at that point in time cannot think of a single thing i couldn't um my sponsor had to list them for me but that changes so teshuva eight and nine so from that very same thing that we work so hard on in step four that inventory we're going to make a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all just willing we're not even doing anything about it yet but we have to make a list of everybody we had harmed as a result of how we chose to live our lives some people get a little anxious about that too because they know what's next all right okay so here's where it's just like high holy days all right so those people that you harmed, you have to go make a direct amends to them. You can't just say, oh, Hashem, please forgive me. I hurt this person. And it's all over. That's an easy way out. That's an easier, softer way. It's, it's not going to work. So step nine is you make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so when injure them or others. So in making an amends, you don't want to do more harm than good. So there are situations where maybe making a direct amends is not the best option. And there's tons of examples I'm not going to get into today, but you have to make a list of who you can make direct amends to -to face-to-face, who you're willing to make direct amends to right now. You have to to remember the step before you had to be willing to make direct amends to, to everybody. It might not happen that day or that month, you know, and this is a step that could take a little time. And then, of course, if somebody's gone from this earth, You're obviously not going to make a direct amends, but there's ways to do that too. And obviously financial amends, you have to make right. That's why it's very important in this step too, to go with a a mentor to kind of help you decipher what you should do directly and what um, maybe indirectly. But this is where I learned the difference between an amends and an I'm sorry. Because I had said I'm sorry a trillion times, a trillion times, I'm sorry. I won't drink tomorrow, I promise. I'll stop drinking. And then, you know, that's a whole nother story. Then you get lying, deceitful. It's just a whole set of bad. But amends means I got to change my behavior, which ties, I think, into six and seven, those character traits. I mean, it has to be a lifelong process to change these behaviors. And that's what's going to make that sorry real, what makes it an amends. And that has a whole set of humility in it too, having to go up to somebody. And sometimes they don't even know why you're, you're apologizing to them. But you have to. You just got to say you're sorry. You can keep it in general terms. If there's something specific, you don't have to rehash like every single bad thing you may have done. Different sponsors are think about in different ways. And then say why you're saying sorry. Because I was acting in pure jealousy. I was envious. I had certain ideas about you that certainly weren't true. And I wasn't, cult- you know, for me, a lot of it, I wasn't cultivating the relationship. You know, like what your part was in it. And then 
they either forgive you or they don't. Most of the time, I was very blessed in that everybody forgave me. But if they don't, that's up to them. You've done your part. I have to keep my side of the street clean. I've done, I'm cleaning up the wreckage of my past and it's, I can't expect to get forgiveness back, but I can ask for it. The same principle at Yom Kippur. You ask the person, I think three times and they still won't forgive you. In God's eyes, you, you did everything you could do. And then you, you move on. I will say most people are forgiving, but you have to remember on the flip side here, everybody that was on my list was family because I was pretty isolated there during during those years. I know at Yom Kippur, when I'm determining and I'm trying to figure out who I need to ask forgiveness from, I typically never have to leave my house to <laughs> apologize to the two people that I've done the most harm to. Those of you the closest to you are the ones you tend to, to hurt the most. Unfortunate, but I was going to say, you know, most everybody on my list was family. So then you move on to 10, 11, and 12, which is what I like to refer as maintenance or wash, rinse, repeat. This is our daily reprieve. So, so you don't have to do a massive, because this first initial inventory can go back to, I don't know if you have a grudge or resentment from when you were five. I mean, it can go far that back if you're still holding a resentment against it. So hopefully when you're at step 10, you can just do a daily a daily check-in. So which is continued to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you nip it in the butt as it happened, and this is what, you know, being aware of those character defects and the self-realization that you'll know, you know, I'm, I'm a lot quicker to figure out when I'm wrong. Now, I usually figure it out quicker. Sometimes I'm not as quick to want to admit it. That might take me a little time. <laughs> Maybe the entire day, you know, it just depends. But you take care of it that day. So it doesn't build up to resentment. Because if you remember what I said, those re- resentments are killers. They're the number one offender. They'll, they'll put us right back out there. You, you want to close every day out with every relationship settled out. Yeah. And 11 is thought through prayer and meditation to improve your conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for the knowledge for his will and the power to carry that out. Now, I will say, but when I, by the time I got to step 11, continuous prayer and meditation, I had a sponsor that at the very beginning, step one, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't praying by any means. I had those 911 prayers, you know, like, oh, please let me, get me out of this. Please don't let me mad. Please help me stop drinking, you know, just only when I needed him. But I had a sponsor who told me at the very beginning, whether I knew how to pray or I wanted to pray or not, that I had to start my morning off with a prayer. And she gave me one to say and ask for, ask to be sober that day, keep me sober that day. And then she, I was also instructed at the end of the day to say a prayer. And she gave me one because I didn't know where to start and say, thank you, Hashem, for keeping me sober. So in the very beginning, and I also was instructed to keep a gratitude journal. So you're starting in the very beginning my sponsor had me building a basic formula for every day. So by the time I got through this, this was routine for me. And the beginning of building and changing a perspective, an attitude of gratitude, which is obviously very Jewish, Torah-based. <laughs> Since then, obviously my prayers have evolved in, in pursuit of me doing an Orthodox conversion. I've included the morning prayers. I, before I even hit the ground... I say the Modayani, I get up. For those who are not familiar, can you explain what the Modayani is? Modayani is basically saying, thank you, Hashem, for bringing my soul back to my body and letting me wake up and having the confidence in me that I'm you know, basically worth another day. You, you believe in me. That's why it's so important for those evening prayers too, because that last thought's going to be the thought I probably wake up with. And then if it's not, if I'm woke up on the wrong side of the bed, so to speak, I can say that mode Dayani and get my head in the right space. So it's really creating a thought that I can hold on to for the rest of the day. And then um, I say Shema, and I just started doing the Amida, and, and I'm set for the day. There's bumps in the road sometimes. Obviously, I'm human, but I can always go back to those basics, and I now know the prayers are for me at any time. We, For those of you who are not familiar, there is a prayer we say, the Asher Yatsar, that we say after we go to the bathroom. And it seems sort of silly at first, but when you think about it, 
it's doing just what like Sean is talking about. We're starting our day and throughout the day with being grateful for our body functioning in a way that's necessary for it to operate. And it's something that I always just took for granted. And it, there, all these, these prayers are all there just to build in gratitude. And once we can become grateful for being able to go to the bathroom and being able to wake up in the morning, then we just sort of create that momentum with us throughout the day. And for someone that myself who did so much damage to my body, those prayers really take on a whole new meaning because I am super grateful that my body is functioning at a pretty normal capacity. Thank you, Hashem. So the final step is having had a spiritual awakening. And there's a whole like little appendix in the book about spiritual awakening. I think I thought for a long time it was going to be like a burning bush moment. And I think a lot of people wait for that. And then as I started going through these steps and becoming more Torah observant and understanding more about Judaism and Torah, that one, I was not Moses, wasn't even close to be Moses, the most humble man to ever walk the face of the earth, and that God's not going to give me a burning bush. But he can speak to me in so many other ways. And now my spiritual waking was more of a learned one. It's gradual, and I don't know when or where it happened, but it happened. So 12, having had a spiritual waking as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to the alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So service, giving back. And this always reminds me of Perkei Avot, the three pillars, Torah, prayer, acts of loving kindness. And there you go. You got those three things going. You can't go wrong. And on the, the service, expand on that, why that's so important to the healing process for an alcoholic? Well, one, it's sort of the price of admission. You have to give back what was freely given to you. Two, almost for selfish reasons, and I didn't realize this until I started doing it, it helps me stay sober. And each time I help somebody maybe stay sober another day, guide them through the steps, I'm doing that again myself. You know, I'm learning something different, something new. I'm evolving because I'm spreading that message. And the message really is just Hashem. We are not God. We need more than human aid to, to carry us through. Yeah, there's a, one with regard to the service it reminds me of what Rabbi Yokoff will be said when he encouraged me to start teaching because he said the best way to learn, if you really want to take your learning to a new level, teach. And it sounds like that's what they built into the system because the more you teach it, the more you're going to learn it for yourself. And that's going to more solidify you in this new place you are of sobriety. Yeah, if I can put into words what I know, then I know that I know it, or that I'm learning it or I'm knowing it better. But service work can come in all shapes of forms in AA. I mean, it's showing up to a meeting, sharing a little bit of your story, chairing meetings, having sponsees. I mean, not all of this is for everybody. There's just a ton of different ways to do service work, going in and making the coffee. Coffee's very big in AA cleaning the bathrooms, you know, just a little humility, you know, like just give back in some way because, you know, you weren't asked for anything, but your willingness when you walked in the door. I know like Joshua, Moses's student, one of the reason he was the successor in line was because he was the one who was his sort of right hand man that he was learning from the entire time. And when they would go into the tent of meeting where Moses would get prophecy and teach the oral Torah and the law to all the sages, Joshua was the one that would come in and set up all the chairs, get everything ready. He would clean up afterwards. And it was because of his merit of just being humble and facilitating the Torah learning that is what allowed him to have the merit to be the next in succession after Moses died. And it seems like that same sort of principle of having that heart of a servant helping out others is what empowers us. And it also, too, you know, that whole idea that the reason Moses was as big as all the Jewish people, even though he was the humblest, because he just became a servant to help out everyone else. And that is what created the vacuum to allow Hashem to enter in, that to create that vacuum for God's presence to dwell with inside of him. And that's basically what they're having you do in AA is by continually helping out other people, it's keeping you in that state of humility that allows you to stay connected, which is what it's all about, is staying connected to God. 
Yeah, I mean, there's really no hierarchy. I mean, like somebody that cleans the toilet, and we all have to do it, or, or keep the supplies and stuff. It just keeps us remembering that I'm no different than the person that just walked in the door. You know, we're only that. It's just 24 hours a day. There's nothing guaranteeing my sobriety, no matter how many years one has. There's lots more I could could have said and didn't touch on, but this is just a portion of my story. If it reached anybody or touched anybody, I'm so happy. I, I hope I, I said enough. I, I was really grateful for the opportunity to just share a little. Thank you so much, Shauna. And I really appreciate you sharing that story and having the courage to to share it with the world. And I and I what I, I I thought it was so valuable and I was so appreciative when she offered to do this because all of us, I mean, this is the recipe that we all have to strive for every day. It is continually developing our amuna. It's continual character refinement, evaluating all our relationships daily. We're not supposed to wait to Yom Kippur. We're supposed to be doing this daily, making sure all of our relationships are intact, to have a, a service mentality, to study Torah and to teach Torah, you know, to do the, the mitzvot of giving tzedakah and, and looking for the needs of others before they come to you with an open hand. It's to caring for the sick. All these things are what empower us and get us closer to God. And as Rabbi Cohen has said, there's nothing anyone lacks but a Muna. If we think there's anything else we lack, it's an illusion. Only thing we lack is a Muna. We just need more Muna, more Muna, more Muna. And kudos to the people that started the 12 step AA program and really took Torah principles and, and brought it to the masses. That's a whole story in itself where it derived from. They didn't think they were lifting from Torah. Once wisdom comes into this world from above, it's there for anyone who wants it to grab it. And I think it's something that even for in the Jewish community, even if we've been religious our entire life, that you know, we can we all have to take these concepts, these principles, and infuse them into everything we're doing from Torah study to all the mitzvot. Sean, I think you spoke to everyone in all situations and shared some very valuable words and wisdom. So thank you so much. I guess with any out of darkness, which is what I was in, comes light. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.